I'm back with some Linux news this week. We're first talking about Ubuntu 26.04 and Canonical's plan to make it the Linux desktop experience that finally goes mainstream. This is an interview taken by ZDNet. It was a talk between the CEO, Mark Shuttleworth, and the VP of Engineering, John Seeger, and their vision. Basically, Canonical, the company behind Ubuntu, is trying again to make Linux mainstream on the desktop while tightening up how Ubuntu is built and cured. The CEO of Canonical wants to make Ubuntu just work for every users. In this conversation, the vision here from Shuttleworth, he tells ZDNet that he's an open source true believer, claims to want Canonical to continue working across the full open source spectrum. If you want to use open source on the cloud, we will come to the cloud with you. And if you want to use it on tiny little devices, we will be there for you as well. But what's more interesting is Seeger's thoughts on Ubuntu 26.04 as there are some big plans for Ubuntu 26.04. We've already seen Canonical's push for changing up utilities into Rust like sudo rs and the core utilities. But the question is, how are they planning on making Ubuntu 26.04, the Linux desktop that finally goes mainstream? Well, the mission over here in this article is that Linux's biggest weakness on the desktop is fragmentation and complexity of using it. The plan, which I see no concrete understanding of how they're gonna accomplish this. But as mentioned here, Shuttleworth continued, I'm a believer in the potential of Linux to deliver a desk that could have a wider and universal appeal. But he also thinks the open source community needs to understand that building desktops for people who aren't engineers is different. We need to understand that simple and just works is also important. So as far as I can gather from this interview, Canonical's core plan seems to be to focus on a just works user experience. Don't know how they're gonna do that. Modernize its foundations and deliver security and reliability while maintaining the open source transparency. I don't know that any of this is actually going to bring more users to Ubuntu or even Linux, as I think a lot of different distributions do this well already, including Mint, especially for people who are transitioning over from Windows. It's an interesting read either way. I'll put a link in the description below. Overall, feels like a lot of corporate speak. We're not gonna get too far into it because there's a lot to cover today. Is 2026 the year of the Linux desktop? Let me know in the comment section below. In other news, the viewing, the GNU Linux fork of Debian without system D has just released version six, and it's built around the idea of init freedom, meaning you can choose a simpler or alternative startup system like system v init open RC or run it instead of being forced to use system D, which is what a majority of Linux distributions use as their service manager. Again, used by modern Linux distributions like Ubuntu, Fedora, Debian, a lot of distros use system D. So this is basically just Debian 13 rebuilt for people who don't want to use system D and just gives you other options. System v init or system D are all what are called init systems or service managers. Basically, it's the first program that runs when Linux starts up and stays running to manage other processes. Its key jobs include boot and startup management, service supervision, logging, user session and devices, timing and networking. So it is important to have choices. And Devuant does give you these, calling it software freedom your way. Anyways, just a release announcement on that one. And big news for GNOME, as it is completely removing support for X11. Starting with GNOME 50, its default display engine, Mutter, will only use Wayland. Although X11 apps can still run through the compatibility layer that they're going to use X Wayland. This is a big deal as X11 has powered Linux desktops for many decades at this point. And GNOME is finally making a decision to mark the end of X11 on mainstream desktops. Wayland is clearly becoming the default of the future. And the announcement here to completely drop the whole X11 backend is a big one. As over four months ago, this was started, but has been officially merged a day or two ago. And it'll be interesting to see if other desktop environments and display engines go the same route. Now that GNOME has really started the avalanche, it'll be interesting to follow along with. In other desktop environment news, KD Plasma has received new updates in 6.6, .6, including network widget that has a little button you can click to connect to a network QR code. Here's what things look like with that new feature in networks. A few more things added for Plasma 6.6 .6 include more accurate color picking, a polished Breeze GTK, which means Breeze style GTK apps get cleaner toolbars with side padding and better colored separator lines, easier remote desktop troubleshooting, including error messaging, directly on the page instead of having you look at some logs, which is a very nice thing to add. As you can see here, we have the error message from the RDP server telling you exactly what the error is instead of having to dig through the logs. Small but visible polish and usability fixes here on Plasma 6.6, .6, but that's not the biggest news. The biggest news for Plasma 6.6 .6 users, the team has reduced Plasma's memory usage by over 100 megabytes by being clever about unloading 
wallpaper images that aren't needed anymore. This had a side effect of making tiled wallpapers impossible with the new system for technical reasons. So tiled wallpapers have been reintroduced in the form of tiled wallpaper plugin. So you can still rock out to your favorite KD One Nose wallpaper. And this is a wild improvement as I love to see a desktop team that's highly focused on improving performance and efficiency by cutting down memory usage. Freeing up 100 megabytes is a great thing. It makes plasma faster, lighter, and smoother, especially on laptops where you have low RAM setups. 100 megabytes can be significant. And I love to see this in a, in a desktop experience where they use less memory and try to optimize the desktop to be better for everyone. Versus when you use the Windows desktop, well, they just wanna add new features, cost more resources, and make people upgrade hardware. It's become menacing to use the desktop environment in Windows. I don't know how many of you have to use things like Outlook and Teams, but good luck using it on even 16 gigs of RAM nowadays. It's just fascinating how we have a stark difference between desktops on Windows versus desktops on Linux. That's for another video though. We're gonna move on as this is an awesome announcement and a great reason for people to use KDE Plasma 6.6. We're seeing updates to Affinity on Linux. For those of you unaware, Affinity is a suite that just relaunched as a single unified app branded as simply as Affinity under Canva. And the core features here are free while advanced features require a Canva Pro subscription. But this is the cool part is Affinity apps like Designer, Photo and Publisher, although they're supported on Windows and Mac OS, not officially on Linux, but there is an install script called Affinity on Linux, which makes it fairly easy to just run an install script and get Affinity Studio on your desktop. This means that Linux creatives can access a very strong alternative to Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator, and Adobe InDesign on a platform like Linux where professional design tooling is somewhat limited. And it is a big gap that causes people not to actually switch from Windows. With this Wine build, you can install the x86 64-bit version of Affinity. And it's very easy to use. One of the devs actually does a how-to guide on this on YouTube. I'm gonna post a link in the description below if you wanna check that out. But it's an interesting move by Canva to take this software and make it free. Again, if you want some of the AI built-in stuff, you have to pay for Canva Pro Edition. I personally use Canva a lot because it's web-based and I can take and make thumbnails on it anywhere I'm at, including on, of course, Linux, because again, it's web-based. So I do use it a lot. I'm interested in this Affinity software now and whether or not it can replace Photoshop for me. I'm gonna be checking it out soon, so don't forget to subscribe below and smash that like button for more Linux news like this and to follow along whenever I install Affinity. And who knows, maybe there's a different flavor coming to us in this pro-grade photo editing vector design and illustration software. If you do have a Mac or Windows computer, you can install this today and get away from Photoshop entirely for free. I'm not being sponsored. I just like the fact that you can get away from Photoshop for free. That's a pretty great thing in itself. So I figured I'd cover this as a lot of people thought Affinity Studio would be ending. No, it's been bought by Canva and now you can download Affinity free. One thing I will mention is you do need a Canva account in order to download. I'll post a link in the description below if your software out. Kernel developers are now planning to let the Linux kernel be compiled with flags that enables Microsoft C extension, which is the dash FMS extensions flag. See here, kernel build, enable FMS extension, which are features used by Microsoft's compiler that aren't actually part of the standard C library. While this doesn't make Linux dependent on Microsoft tools, but it does tell GCC and C Clang to allow certain Microsoft style code syntax inside the kernel for convenience and is interesting as this patch is expected to land in Linux kernel 6.19 if Linus Torvalds and other maintainers. Are. It's interesting as historically, Linux has avoided tying itself to any sort of Microsoft convention. And the mention here is once in a while, it turns out that enabling dash FMS extensions could allow some slightly prettier code. But every time it has come up, the code code that had to be used instead has been deemed not too awful and not worth introducing another compiler flag for. That's probably true for each individual case, but then it's somewhat of a chicken egg situation. If we just bite the bullet, as Linus says, and enable it once and for all, it is available whenever a use case turns up and no individual case has to justify it. And here's a few examples of justifications. Undoubtedly, there are more places in the code where this could also be used, but where dash FFMS extensions just didn't come up in any discussion. So simply, this patch adds a compiler flag to the Linux kernel build system and allows and tells GCC or, or Clang to allow certain Microsoft style C language feature. It is interesting that we're introducing Microsoft style C syntax features in Linux. Let me know what you think about this in the comment section below. 
It's been a few months since Wayland introduced HDR support with their color management version one protocol and now Qt, and now Qt, one of the most widely used Linux and cross-platform app toolkits is introducing HD port by implementing color management version one from Wayland. This means that Qt apps built on the Qt framework can now accurately display and handle HDR color on Wayland desktops like GNOME and KDE, leading to a more consistent professional grade color across different screens. Starting with Qt 6.10, we're now HD ready when using Qt to apps. For those of you unaware, Qt is a cross-platform framework used to build graphical user interfaces for applications that can run on Linux, Windows, Mac OS, Android, all from a single code base. It's really prevalent in application design, both commercially and in open source projects. That's why it's such a big deal that this coming to Qt. Anyways, it'll be interesting to see how Apple end up HDR support. Hyperland, the modern dynamic Wayland compositor for Linux has seen some updates with the Hyperland 0.52 release, including things like rendering, smooth surface resizing, pixel level accuracy tweaks and damage tracking fixes, 10-bit color display, screen copy has been fixed with HDR deep color monitors, some crash fixes, and some new features including auto-closing submaps, full screen controls, as there hadn't been an update in a while, so it's nice to see this. The new stuff also includes new CM options, DSIP3, DP3, and Adobe. You can now set rotation for each device supports it and a new modal prop for window rules. And you can get the raw release right now on GitHub where it goes into more changes. And in other news, the Arch install script, which has been under Arch Linux for quite a while now and is officially supported under the default installer image, allows you to easily install Arch Linux without having to go through, do everything manually. But something that has been missing and highly requested is a Wi-Fi connection menu. That's right. A Wi-Fi connection menu with textual has been added. This introduces a bunch of new things. The primary goal here was to, was to introduce a new Wi-Fi connection menu to address a long-standing issue, which is, has been around since January 29th, 2023. When implementing it, it became clear that Curses already has challenges with inputs of, of non-ASCII characters, which K okay, for the existing inputs, such as username and password configurations, but for existing Wi-Fi passwords that most likely contain a special character beyond ASCII, it will not work. It could be run in a raw mode, but it would require more customization and handling. Therefore, they introduce textual which it currently lives alongside the Curses implementation and is only used for the Wi-Fi connection menu, which only triggered if Arch install is run in offline mode using WPA CLI and can be run or enabled successfully. This is a big deal for Arch Linux as the installer. Arch install is the easiest way to install Arch Linux at this point and a Wi-Fi connection menu built with a modern text user interface framework called Textual is quite a big deal as it makes the Wi-Fi setup during the installation more reliable, modern, and user-friendly and fixes long-standing input bugs, improves how people install Arch Linux as the Arch install script has been widely successful. This is definitely cool to see. Another interesting one, the free desktop organization which maintains many core Linux desktop standards, has officially adopted the File System Hierarchy Standard, FHS, which defines where files and folders belong on Linux systems like user, etc., var, home, bin, all the fun ones. And the idea here is to start with the FHS 3.0 from 2015 and modernize and update it so that today's desktop users have unified directory rules. So in short, free desktop org is taking over the file system hierarchy standard and going to work on modernizing in this announcement we've adopted file system hierarchy standard at free desktop it's now part of the regular set of specifications and we can make edits of course right now it's very historically interesting but hopefully it will be practical in the future too to receive some modernization and we can take a look at the full file system hierarchy standard that, as it currently sits. The standard consists of set requirements and guidelines for file and directory placement under Unix like operating systems. And the last copyright was the Linux Foundation and now it is free desktop. I'll put a link in the description below if you're interested in some of the file system conventions for the root file system and the different hierarchies that we have for file systems on Unix and Linux systems. It is an interesting read. And something interesting, Chaotic AUR is a community-driven and maintained Arch Linux repository that provides pre-built binaries of popular Arch user repository packages. That way, users do not have to compile them manually. And there's a new announcement that has been made by Chaotic AUR, and it's a trusted maintainer system, meaning only verified vetted maintainers can now can manage or update packages in the repository. So zooming in here, this comes after the rising count of cases of malware in the AUR. 
we now have a system of trusted maintainers list in place. This comes after issues like malicious packages installing remote access trojans, including a recent package in the AUR that was under the LibreWolf fix bin, Firefox patch bin, and Zen browser patch bin, which were all binaries that were uploaded and found to deploy a chaos remote access trojan and occurred earlier this year in July. These malicious package builds were pulled into a GitHub repository and ran during build or installation of the binaries, which installed this rat. Of course, this incident triggered warnings and discussion about the trust model of the AUR. So that's why things like the chaotic AUR are adding a trusted maintainer. So another one in October, some AUR packages in the MDB tools and Materia theme Git were flagged by users as a hijacked under a new user who also uploaded versions that referenced some malicious remote code executions as there's clearly examples of supply chain risk in the AUR where users can upload build scripts that run locally on your machine, which of course can introduce malicious builds, install backdoors, trojans, malware, and compromise systems all over. So it's interesting to see this as there is a trust versus freedom trade-off here. One of the main strengths of the AUR is the openness and flexibility to install whatever packages that you want. But of course that comes with the trade-off of more of this freedom risk. So it's going to be interesting to see how chaotic AUR ends up working out. While we can't tell yet how sustainable reviewing the untrusted portion of package updates will be, it is certainly a good step to take moving forward. Maybe this also opens the door for tribute by reviewing the package updates created via pull requests. So it'll be interesting if the official AUR ends up following suit. The official AUR is run and maintained directly by the Arch Linux team. But Chaotic AUR is a community-run project mainly by the Garuda Linux developers. It's unofficial and independent of Arch Linux. As the official AUR does not have a trusted maintainer or a verified publisher system like Chaotic AUR just introduced, it'll be interesting to see if the model ever gets pulled up into the official AUR in an attempt to provide a safer, faster, and pre-vetted AUR ecosystem. And another interesting news for Linux AI hardware users, AMD just released the first major Linux version of the Ryzen AI software stack, version 1.6.1, which finally brings official MPU or neural processing unit support to Linux systems via the Ryzen AI chip. So in supported configuration, including the Ryzen 200 series, 7,000 series, 8,000 series, and AI 300 series, version 1.6.1 got released. Ryzen AI Linux release available through the Ryzen AI software early access lounge now has support for CNN transformer and LLM flows. This means that official Linux support under Ubuntu 24.04 long-term support with kernel edition 6.10 or above now officially supports Ryzen AI. This is a big deal for Linux as native AI acceleration on Linux desktops will be possible. Developers can also open better integration for things like PyTorch and TensorFlow while using MPU inference on Linux workstations and laptops now. So it's a real step forward for cross-platform AI hardware parity. And we officially have Linux installation instruction for Ryzen AI on Linux systems. And here are the prerequisites in order to use it, including installing Python amongst Ubuntu. And the recommended amount of RAM you have to have is 64 gigs. And it shows you how to install the MPU drivers and how to install Ryzen AI software and to even test the installation. And finally, you can run through examples of using Ryzen AI software to demonstrate how various model compilation deployment on MPUs works. This is a huge milestone as people who are trying to use Windows Copilot Plus counterparts are now going to see similar tools being built on Linux as well. And historically, NVIDIA has always trailed AMD when it comes to introducing developments for Linux. AMD clearly understands that a lot of AI researchers, machine learning engineers, and other open source contributors use Linux first and foremost. And I think this is actually a strategic on AMD's part. And we'll see how AMD builds on top of open source by releasing Ryzen AI on it. We'll see how all this plays out and what tools we end up getting and what other things from AMD that we get here in upcoming releases. Well, that's it. Thanks for watching to the end. You're a true fan. Don't forget to subscribe below and smash that like button for more news videos like this. Catch me in a great community on Discord and I'll catch you in another video. Thanks for watching.